This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic okay, Society. Today we have Dr. Peter Van Alphen, the one, the only. Uh, Dr. Van Alphen was trained initially as a classical philologist uh, before continuing his studies in nautical archaeology. Uh, in fact, he, today he still continues with uh, UNESCO's ongoing attempts to protect underwater cultural heritage, which is uh, an important cause. Uh, he joined the ANS in 2002 to oversee the Greek cabinet, but is now, of course, the chief curator. He has served as the editor of the AJN from 2005 to 2008, uh, the ANS magazine from 2004 to the present, and is uh, was director of the Eric P. Newman uh, Graduate Summer Seminar in Numismatics from 2002 to 2023. Uh, he has co-curated a number of uh, exhibits, including the Art of Devastation, which is probably one of the most popular, and there's an accompanying book as well. Since 2015, he has co-directed with uh, Ethan Gruber the um, uh, Hellenistic Royal Coinages, HRC, which many of you probably use on a daily basis. And they also received another grant in 2020 for the Indo-Greek and Bactrian coinage. And 2017 to 2018, he was, of course, the president of the New York Numismatic Club. In 2022, he was uh, elected fellow of the Society of the Antiqui uh, Antiquaries of London, um, and most recently, if you're paying attention to our uh, news and website, he is now the chairperson of the Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee, the CCAC. He's been a member of that for about two years now, uh, but just earlier this week, it was publicly announced that he is now the chairperson. Uh, clearly, we could have a whole long table about Peter himself, but that's not what, what we're here for. So I'm going to hand it over to Peter now. Thank you. Oh, that's very kind of you, Jesse. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to welcome all of you today to a long table that um, brings together a number of diverse interests of mine. Um, ships, of course, um, numismatics, and, and also my Dutch heritage. Um, so uh, let me see if I can get this PowerPoint started here. All right, there we go. All right, so for those interested in both numismatics and nautical history, as I obviously am, the 17th century is a fascinated, fascinating period to study. Over the course of several major conflicts, notably the Long War for Independence, the Dutch fought against the Spanish, followed almost immediately by the Anglo-Dutch Wars, as well as the immense growth of overseas trade and exploration, the 17th century witnessed significant developments in ship design and construction and also naval tactics. At the same time, the metal, as both a public and private instrument for fomenting nationalism and commemorating people and events, reached new levels of importance and new audiences, fueled in part by the burgeoning art market in the Netherlands. As one might expect, given their importance to seafaring people like the Dutch and the English, ships figured prominently on many of the metals produced in the 17th century. And when looking at these depictions of ships on metals, several questions come to mind. Given the fact that most of the engravers and silversmiths producing these metals were not specialized marine artists, as, other, as others were at the time, as we'll see, um, what sources did the metalists use to develop their designs for their metals? And secondly, how accurate were the depictions of the ships they illustrated? So in the first part of the talk today, I'll address these questions before turning to another nautical aspect of 17th century medallic art, and that is the depiction of shipwrecks and salvage on metals. But before we get to all of that, I'd like to set the stage briefly by providing an overview of both some of the changes that took place in the maritime world of the 17th century and some of the developments that took place in the art world as well. So prior to the 17th century, the primary tactic in naval engagements was to lay alongside an enemy vessel, board the ship with your troops and overwhelm the crew in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This was no more than an extension of land-based tactics, and as on land, defensive tactics relied on walls and fortifications, which when translated to ships, meant that they were built with very tall structures fore and aft. 
the forecastle or foxhole as it became pronounced later on, and the aftercastle. With the development of land-based guns and cannon, there was also a push to find ways to put artillery on, on board ships, which slowly began to change tactics, namely trying to repel or destroy enemy ships by blasting them with broadside side cannon fire. By the time of the ill-fated Spanish Armada in 1588, newer, sleeker ship designs were being developed with much reduced castles fore and aft that were more nimble and quick than the lumbering carracks that preceded them. Many of these develops happened in fits and starts until roughly the mid 17th century, when greater standardization in shipboard artillery and ship design culminated in the grand ships of the line used in the new line ahead battle tactic introduced by the British in the first Anglo-Dutch war. Battle fleets now incorporated a number of different sized ships rated primarily according to the number of guns they carried from the massive first rates ships carrying up to 100 heavy guns on three decks to the small fifth rate sloops carrying a dozen and a half smaller guns on a single deck. The next 200 years saw the continuing refinement of the ships of the line and their tactics, but no dramatic changes took place until the introduction of steam propulsion, steel armor, and turreted guns in the 19th century. Along with these transformations in hull design and armament in the 17th century, developments in the rigging of ships also took place, driven in part by the need to find efficient and capable sail configurations for long oceanic voyages. Additional masts and sails were added to the traditional single mast Northern European rigs until the three mast square rig with topsails became the standard rig on large ships, including naval vessels, as you can see in this illustration. Oops, go back, there we go. <clears throat> it is important to understand as well that ships, as the most complex and expensive machines of their day, were also vehicles for projecting power and prestige, and not just through the mouths of the roaring cannon, but also through their decorations and fittings. Ships of the 17th century are among the most elaborately decorated ever to sail the seas, especially their sterns and quarter galleries. So much emphasis, in fact, was put on these decorations that they could account for up to a third of the cost of the ship something that governments and navies beginning the, in the early 18th century were no longer willing to pay for. Many of these decorations and their schema, which typically were related to the name of the ship and the sovereign or government paying for it, were designed by some of the leading artists of the day, such as Anthony van Dyck, a leading Dutch artist employed by the English crown, who designed the decorations for Sovereign of the Seas, a ship launched in England in 1637. And this just underscores the link between ships and art at the time. In the art world itself, the 17th century in the Netherlands, both in the Dutch Republic and in the Spanish Netherlands, saw a massive increase in the number of artworks produced, feeding a voracious art market, which itself was fueled by the great amounts of new wealth bundled into people's pockets from overseas trade, such as that conducted by the Dutch East India Company founded in 1602 and the West India Company founded in 1621. It has been estimated that over 10 million paintings were produced in the Dutch Republic in, in, the, Dutch Republic in the 17th century, of which less than 1% remain today including those by the famed masters of the period like Rembrandt and Vermeer. Besides paintings, prints, drawings, pamphlets, books, and all manner of decorative items were produced and collected in large volume, and not just by the wealthy, but also by those from all levels of society. Within this milieu, individual artists and artisans struggled and competed to try to carve out lucrative niches for themselves. Among the new types of art introduced by the Dutch in the 17th century was marine art. Paintings, prints, drawings, as well as tapestries, tiles, and other items that focused on ships, naval battles, and seafaring. 
Compared to the number of artists engaged in biblical, historical, portrait, still life, and landscape paintings, those who truly excelled at marine art were more limited in number. And those that did, like the famed father and son duo, Willem van de Velde, the elder and the younger, were absolute masters in depicting ships in correct and thoroughly stunning detail. The elder van de Velde's talent, in fact, earned him ringside seats at some of the major naval battles during the Anglo-Dutch Wars, like the Battle of Schreifeninge in 1653, um, for paintings of battles commissioned by, for example, the Holland Admiralty. Following the disastrous French invasion of the Netherlands in the Rampiar of 1672 and the economic depression that followed, the Van de Veldes moved to England where their reputation earned them salaried court positions producing images and paintings for King Charles II, who like his father before him and his brother, the Duke of York, the future King James II, had a keen interest in ships and sailing. Over their lifetimes, the Van de Veldes produced thousands of images of all sorts, paintings, prints, drawings, and, and so forth, which can now be found in museums and private collections all over the world. For medallic artists then, many of whom were trying to find their niche, there was potentially no shortage of illustrative material to use in designing medals featuring ships. The question is, more specifically, what might they have used and how would they interpret it? We know for a fact that medallic artists use the work of other artists in creating their designs. And to take one example, this, feature, uh, this medal features a portrait of the famed Dutch Admiral Martin Tromp, who lost his life at the Battle of Schreifeninge in 1653, a devastating blow to the Dutch Republic. Tromp was a popular naval, naval figure, much like Horatio Nelson was in England a century and a half later. And Tromp's Death in the battle and the death in combat spurred a great deal of artistic work, like this medal, that was largely meant for the popular market. The portrait of Tromp, as is noted on the medal itself, was based on the work of Jan Lievens, a major figure in the Dutch art world and part of Rembrandt's circle. In fact, you can see just down on the bottom here, there's, you can't really see it in this illustration, but. Um, a little note that this is based on Levens, and then um, the engraver's name is over there. Um, the medal was engraved by Dirk van Rijswijk, and as far as I'm aware, this is the only medal Rijswijk ever created, one that seemed intent to cash in on the flood of Tromp souvenirs following his death. Rijswijk's, oh, sorry, I have to do this on there. All right. Rijswijk's niche was, in fact, this type of Enli work using silver and mother of pearl, which, as you can see, is highly intricate and detailed. For the obverse of the medal, Rijswijk followed Lieven's print portrait closely, demonstrating his talent as an engraver. And in fact, Rijswijk was not the only person to use Lieven's portrait. Others borrowed it as well for other media like prints. The reverse of the medal shows a naval battle scene focusing on three ships from the stern, two of which to the left are blasting away at each other with cannon fire, and a third to the right is on fire and starting to heel over. Reisvik takes full credit for this image, and there's nothing exceptional about it, not in detail or composition. It is, in fact, full of naval battle scene tropes, like the sinking ship and the melee in the background, that could be found on any number of pieces of marine art, including run-of-the-mill paintings, prints, as well as broadsides like this one. But Eisvig, I'm sure, did not base this um, image on his medal on any particular piece of other artwork like the Levin's portrait of Tromp, but rather borrowed bits and sketched a very generic battle scene, demonstrating in the process how little he knew and probably cared about ships. A man of his talent could have done much better if he had had the interest to do so and if his audience expected it. 
In fact, much, could be say, much the same could be said about the naval battle scenes on a number of the truly impressive medals by Wouter Müller. Impressive for their large size, wonderful portraits of Dutch admirals on the obverse, and their incredible high relief. And this high relief was due to Müller's unique way of producing the metals using the silversmith's repoussé technique rather than engraving dyes or creating molds for casting. Each side was hammered out separately and the two halves then soldered together and filled. This method by its very nature did not allow for some of the very fine detail that we see in some other struck metals, but still could, when pushed, produce an above average portrait of a ship, as we'll see in a moment. The ships and battle scenes on the reverse of Mueller's Admiral Medals, however, some of which were shared among the different Admiral obverses, were by contrast rather pedestrian, again full of tropes and inaccuracies and obviously not meant for a discerning audience. Mueller did produce one rather remarkable image of an allegorical ship of peace in 1654, that must have been carefully copied from the work of a skilled marine artist like this etching here by Rainier Nooms. The metal reverse exists in a number of different variants and was reused with slight modification in 1667 um, for this piece of, Breda, piece of Breda metal. But in the best examples, the ship is quite accurately portrayed including such esoteric details like the bowline bridles, the blocks in the stays and running rigging, the correct rake of the mast, the step down in the aft gun ports on the lower deck, and so forth. All things to make a nautical nerd like myself smile. Overall, too, the scaling of the ship looks correct, as does the crew working amidships. Rather oddly, however, the trumper, trumpeter on the poop deck is an absolute giant. Um, at least three times the size of his shipmates, underscoring the additional fantasy aspects of the image. You can see this trumpeter figure here towards, right there in the stern. Confirmation that medallic artists did, in fact, use the work of marine artists from time to time comes from the invoices of another engraver, Matthias Huf de Junge. Hooft was a silversmith and engraver who became master of the Middleburg Silversmiths Guild in 1660 and who succeeded his father as engraver of the Zealand Mint. In the mid-1660s, he was commissioned by the Zealand Admiralty to produce a new great seal with a depiction of a ship as its centerpiece. Hooft must have felt some pressure to produce an accurate depiction of the ship since his invoices include reimbursements for drawings he purchased to aid him in producing the images. Some 15 years later, in 1680, Hooft produced a medal commemorating the return of a VOC fleet from the East Indies, which depicts a similar ship with the arms of Zealand as part of the stern decoration. Hooft's depictions are certainly passable, but not quite as detailed in terms of the rigging as the Mueller medal we saw earlier. And as a side note, this well-known portrait of Willem van de Velde Junge shows him in the midst of painting a, 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 a large-scale painting with drawings of ships scattered about the floor, illustrating just how these types of reference drawings and others would be used. Arguably, the most masterful depiction of ships on metals in the 17th century were not the work of medallic artists working in the, in the Dutch Republic, but were rather those of a Flemish engraver from Antwerp working for the English crown. John Wultier was a member of an extensive family of engravers who variously worked for mints all across Europe. And in 1661, John left the Antwerp mint to take up a position at the Royal Mint in London and by 1670, he was chief engraver there. Wurtier is rightly recognized as one of the most accomplished engravers of the 17th century, something that is clearly seen in his medals illustrating ships. To take but one example, this large medal features an exceptional portrait of James, Duke of York on the obverse, who also served as Lord High Admiral in his brother's navy. During the 
massive Battle of Lustoft in June 1665, in which over 100 British ships fought over 100 Dutch ships, the Duke was commanding the English fleet above uh, aboard the first-rate ship Royal Charles, which engaged the Dutch flagship Indrak. In the course of the action, Indrak received a fatal shot to one of its magazine and was blown to pieces. This medal commemorating that action, and this medal commemorates that action and illustrates the beginning of the engagement, showing Royal Charles coming up on Indrak and beginning to heave to. The depiction of the ship is remarkably accurate, right down to the royal arms on the stern, and the overall scene is quite realistic, including the viewpoint from close to water level. And it is tempting to think that Rotier collab collaborated with other exceptional artists like the Van de Veldes to produce this medallic image, or at least had access to some of their work, like these ship portraits of the elder Van de Velde. In 1667, just two years after the Battle of Lewisdorf, the Dutch had their revenge for the sinking of the Eindracht. When the fleet under the command of de Reiter made a brilliant raid on the English naval base at Chatham, burned a number of ships, captured Royal Charles, and took it back home with them, as shown in this painting with the ship flying the Dutch colors. And the Royal Arms stern decoration of the ship is on display today in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, where I've had the great pleasure of seeing it in person. <clears throat> so I'd like to wrap up this section by noting the possible influence of marine painting, particularly on two additional medals. The first large medal that was, the first is a large medal that was given to the former director of the West India Company, Johan Root, for his exemplary service when the company was dissolved in 1676. The original was in gold. The ANS has a cast lead copy. The obverse shows two West India Company ships passing in heavy seas mid-ocean. The drama and the movement of the scene is unlike anything else in medallic art of the period and clearly seems derived from similarly dramatic scenes in contemporary marine paintings, such as this one by Heinrich Staitz, whose niche was stormy sea paintings. The second medal, issued to commemorate the murder of the bro brothers Johan and Cornelius de Witt in 1672, who were leading political figures, pro-republic and anti-orangists, who fell victim to a hate campaign following the French invasion. The reverse features two ships wrecking against a rocky coast with a Latin inscription, Una mente et sorte, with one mind and fate. The allegorical potential, as well as visual drama, of ships wrecking was used extensively in 17th century Dutch painting enough so to inspire seven, several recent studies on the topic. The drama and composition of the image on the medal, I would argue, is likewise derived from this genre. And these wrecking vessels then provide an easy segue to the second part of my talk, which is on shipwrecks and salvage on medals. So, the 17th century, as we've noted, saw an enormous increase in seaborne trade. And this was not just between um, different parts of Europe, but of course between Europe and various colonies in the New World, as well as between Europe and points farther east, um, like the East Indies. And the enormous amounts of gold and silver being transported on ships at this time, whether coined or uncoined, was immense not just by the famed Spanish treasure fleets, which brought extracted precious metal wealth from the New World to the Old, but also in the gold and especially silver being used in trade elsewhere. And there was always a risk in putting such great quantities of precious metal on ships. Predation was a serious concern, since the Dutch and the English were always on the lookout to capture Spanish treasure ships, but there was also the risk of unexpected weather, the powerful storms that could overwhelm and sink ships in open water or dry them onto shore, as we've seen. Since antiquity, 
wrecked ships lying in shallower and accessible waters were often salvaged, but within the limitations of divers being able to hold their breaths and the lifting capabilities available to them. And along with the rapid advances in ship technologies, the 17th century also saw advances in salvage technologies, including the perfection of diving bells and heavy lift mechanisms. In the mid 17th century, Hans Albrecht von Preileben, a German Swiss military engineer, along with some others, developed a working combination of diving bell and heavy lift pincers that were demonstrated on recovering cannon from various Baltic shipwrecks, including the ill fated Swedish warship Vasa, which sank in 30 meters of Stockholm or 30 meters of water in Stockholm Harbor on its maiden voyage in 1628, after only sailing 1,200 meters. Amazingly, the largely intact hull of the ship was raised in 1961 and now resides in a museum in Stockholm. And given the enormous expense and value of shipboard artillery, especially bronze cannon, all efforts were made to recover sunken guns when possible. Treileben's successful demonstration recovering Vasa, a cannon from Vasa in 1658, three decades after the ship sank, earned him and his consortium a salvage monopoly from the, uh, from the Swedish king, which greatly increased their reputation. Treileben was subsequently contracted to recover valuables from the wreck of a Dutch ship, Wappen van de Prins, that sank in a storm near the city of Vescapelle in the island of Alcaren in the province of Zeeland in October 1659 on a return voyage from Cadiz. In a fascinating recent study, Albert Meyer and Jan Deleys detail the life of the captain of the ship, Jan Winkart, also known by his nickname Water Drinker, um, detailing the history of his ship and its last tragic voyage. Having served as a captain for the Zealand Admiralty and gaining fame commanding a fire ship during the Battle of Scheveningen in August of 1653, and this is uh, an illustration of that battle, um, although I don't see any fire ships in it. Um, Vinkart was furloughed in 1657 and subsequently purchased the retired fleet vessel of Liesinger from the Admiralty, which he renamed Wappen van de Prins, to try to make a living in regional trade. As part of a convoy of ships returning from Cadiz with tons of silver aboard, much of it meant to be steered to the Zealand Mint to produce Dutch trade coinage, Vinkart decided, when close to home, to peel off from the rest of the convoy and head for his home port of Vire. He never made it. A sudden gale caught him off guard and drove his ship onto a sandbank near Vescapela, where it was battered to pieces, costing Vinkart his life, along with that of most of his passengers. Among those who had silver consignments uh, aboard the ship was the prominent Valkyrie trader, Marcellus van de Gos, who organized Treileben's expedition to Zeeland, which in the end recovered most of the lost silver from the wreck, some of which was turned over to the Zealand mint for striking coins, and some of which presumably was used in 1660 to strike a medal commemorating um, the recovery of the, of the uh, silver and other objects um, at the behest of Van der Hoes. The obverse of the medal depicts Treileben's salvage operation, and this is exceptionally well done, in fact, um, the artistry of that medal, the engraving as well. And the reverse has a, lat a lengthy Latin inscription that translated reads, to commemorate um, the salvage by a wonderful device exceeding the arts of previous centuries near Valkyren and in rough sea under the auspices of the delegates of the states of Zeeland and the care of Marcel Gauss, of a great amount of minted and unminted silver, gemstones, and artillery from a sunken and broken ship deep beneath the sea, with the objects returned to owners according to the law. The artist is unknown, but could possibly be Matisse Hoof de Jonga, whose work we saw a little bit earlier. 
In any event, this was not the only medal struck to commemorate recovered shipwrecked silver in the 17th century. During the brief reign of the English King James II, the former Duke of York, Massachusetts treasure hunter William Phipps located the wreck of the 600-ton Spanish galleon, Nuestra Señora de la Limpia y Pure Concepción, which sank in a storm off the island of Hispaniola on September 28, 1641. Phipps journeyed to England to find backers for his recovery operation, initially receiving support from King Charles II, but ultimately it was the Duke of Albemarle who financed the salvage expedition. Phipps managed to recover over 34 tons of gold and silver from the wreck in 1687, apparently without the need for specialized equipment like Kreilebens. With so much of the loot flowing back to England, James II subsequently knighted Phipps and two medals by the artist George Bauer were struck to commemorate the recovery, both of which are discussed in detail in Christopher McDowell's new Betts Medal Companion that was published by the Numismatic Society recently. This is another medal of that sort. <clears throat> Centuries later, in 1978, treasure hunters from Sequest International Incorporated relocated the remains of the wreck and found an additional 60,000 coins, 10 of which were donated to the society in 1987, and this is one of those 10. Now, while still Duke of York, James II himself was involved in another shipwreck in 1682 when the frigate Gloucester was he was aboard struck a sandbank off the Norfolk coast and in fact this is something of a um, fantasy uh, painting of it because um, this looks a little too close to shore and people seem to be having an easier time getting off when in fact that wasn't the case the Duke was rescued um, and in fact on the metal here you can see a probably a more accurate depiction of the wrecking so the Duke was rescued, but around 250 others lost their lives. And shortly thereafter, this medal then was struck to commemorate um, both the events and um, the Duke's um, miraculous uh, ability to escape that. Interestingly enough, in 2007, um, the wreck of Gloucester was discovered initiating the proper archaeological documentation of the wreck, as you can see here, as well as the recovery of some items, a number of which were displayed at an, at an exhibit um, this last year in 2023 at the Castle Museum in Norwich. And on that happy note, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, if there are any questions, we have uh, just under a half an hour for any questions. Um, if you have any that you would like to uh, just unmute yourself and go for, uh, you're more than welcome to. Um, I am looking uh, in the questions right now. We have one from Scott Safe. Uh, what is your general comments about the rarity of these metals? Uh, some of them, um like the Rotia medal of uh, the Duke of York with the Royal Charles on the reverse is quite rare. Um, this is a really rather large medal. Um, uh, there, there was another medal that was struck commemorating uh, the same battle that was issued uh, to uh, some of the officers and others um, on the British sides. Um, and these medals were given both in silver to gold to some of the um, uh, people who had um, shown exemplary service. Um, those medals are somewhat more common than uh, the, the larger uh, Duke of York medal itself. Um, the Dutch medals, um, the ones by uh, Wouter Muller, for example, are, I, I wouldn't say all that common, but they do come up fairly regularly. And um, one of the things about those medals in particular is that there are a good number of um, variations and variants of them. You know, since both the obverse and the reverse of the metals were produced um, separately and then uh, soldered together, there are um, at times different combinations. And in fact, there was one uh, metal of Muller's that uh, came up not too long ago that was a mule of a 
obverse portraits or a portrait on the obverse of Charles II, sorry, that was done by Peter van Abile, uh, another uh, medallic artist that was producing medals in that same sort of repoussé technique, but it was muled with one of Muller's reverses, um, you know, which begs a lot of questions about um, whether or not, you know, the two were collaborating or, um, you know, other things happened along the way. Um, some of the other medals, uh, such as the one by Reisvik uh, that, that I showed um, to begin with, are um, somewhat more common and also common in a number of different uh, metals as well. In fact, you know, as, as I uh, mentioned, there seem to have been a lot of things produced after Trump um, lost his life at the Battle of Schreifeninger in 1653, and um, a number of artists of one sort or another, or gravers, were essentially just jumping on the gravy train trying to produce things that, um, you know, would. Uh, appeal to the popular market, and um, some of those metals, no doubt, um, were produced in reasonably large uh, quantities, especially those uh, Trump medals. Uh, we have a message from Bob Hope. Lovely presentation, Peter. Thanks. I see that you are unmuted, Bob. I don't know if you want to ask any questions or any follow-ups. No, I just I think it's a, a great presentation. I love seeing all these medals uh, relative to the the topic. Thank uh, you. Uh, yeah, there we go. There, there was a request to show this medal as well. Was it? Was there a question? Um, uh, I have a question from Chuck Heck. Chuck and I are actually uh, direct messaging, so he actually messaged it to me. So I'll read it out for him. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful presentation, Peter. What spurred your interest in these ship medals, uh, the medals themselves, the ships, and do you collect these medals? Um, I do not collect these medals. Um, I, as, as Jesse mentioned in the introduction, uh, my master's degree is in nautical archaeology. Um, I've had a long standing interest in all things boats and ships and seafaring and things of that sort, and um, I'm constantly looking for ways to uh, combined interests, uh, whether it's um, numismatic and uh, ships or uh, my other interest, which is prints. I have a great deal of interest in prints. Um, and in fact, I'm giving another talk on Sunday at the Noble Maritime Collection in Staten Island. Uh, I've been giving a series of lectures there on various prints related to, you know, um, uh, 19th century chromolithographs and steel engraved prints, copper engraved, what have you, um, that uh, have something to do with New York Harbor or, you know, various ships associated with uh, um, New York and so forth. And so this, uh, this again, is just a way for me to combine interests and find ways to um, um, pursue that interest as well. Uh, we have another uh, from Jamie Gray. Uh, if anyone wants to ask their, their own question and not, not necessarily hear me, you're more than welcome to. Uh, Jamie says, hi, Peter. Thanks very much for this talk. Would you please show the slide of the Neptune and, and his trident on the reverse? Um, and I think that you got to that one already. It has a few before uh, the wreck of Gloucester. Was it one of those medals? Um, I'm sorry, the chat just disappeared for me. Uh, was it one of those very medals of this period with classical imagery? Thanks. Uh, actually, classical imagery played a, a fairly significant role uh, in a lot of the medals that were produced at this time. In fact, um, there were other medals produced by Rotier. In fact, let me see if I can um, go back here. Uh, no, wrong direction. No, in the right direction. Sorry. Um, yeah. So uh, some of these medals that were produced by Rotier, for example, um, this medal has on the obverse a depiction of the Duke of York with his long, flowing 17th-century hair. But there are other versions of medals produced by Rotier um, commemorating 
the same events, um, the Battle of Skaifeninga, where he is portrayed as a Roman ruler with short hair. Um, so classical imagery, you know, Roman imagery as well as um, occasionally Greek imagery played a role in various aspects of the metals, but interestingly enough, they also played a large role in the decoration of the ships. Um, a lot of the uh, imagery that uh, appears, for example, on the Sovereign of the Seas, with uh, which uh, Anthony van Dyck um, uh, developed and um, uh, produced, features a good number of uh, Roman and classical type um, figures uh, intermixed with other say, more contemporary figures as well, too. So, you know, both on the metals as well as on, you know, the ship decoration, um, this sort of classical imagery really was uh, playing a fairly large role. That's interesting. Uh, quick comment from Daniel Wolf. Cool metals, thank you. Short and sweet. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is Jim McClellan. And uh, Peter, this is an absolutely fantastic talk and closer to the area of, of in the period that I'm that that I'm familiar with, and just absolutely wonderful, and you know, mm -hmm. heartiest congratulations. Uh, I hesitate to ask you a question about the talk you didn't give. But <laughs> I would be interested if, you, if there's anything to say about you know the French medals and Louis the Louis the Fourteenth medals, whether there's any kind of maritime uh, connection uh, there as well. Yeah, there, there are, um, you know, with his large um, Galerie Metallique series, there, there are, of course, um, a handful of medals that deal with naval topics. And, of course, um, Louis Torres was, was also um, very much engaged in building a large navy and a highly decorated navy as well, too, and, you know, employing a lot of well-known artists to decorate his ships um, and so forth. But... Um, there, there, there just aren't as many French medals being produced at this time that um, really have the, the same sort of naval scenes and depictions or mm -hmm. portrayals of ships that we find on the Dutch medals and you know the uh, the English medals as well. Um, you know, I, you know, if if I were to speak a little longer, I, I probably could have tried to incorporate some of the French material. Um, talk a little bit about that too, but um, what interests me um, here too is just this relationship between the Netherlands and England. You know, at this time where you have a lot of artists from the Low Countries going mm -hmm. to England uh, and being employed, you know, by the English, and it is through this connection, you know, essentially these these Dutch and other artists um, go into England that um, English marine painting really begins to develop in the 18th century, which uh, really didn't exist, um, you know, prior to that in England. So, you know, the influence of, of the Dutch on a lot of what was going on in England at the time, um, you know, was, was really quite important. And I, I don't really think that that flow is going in the other direction towards, you know, France, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Mary Lennon. Certainly, the, 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 uh, the, the Dutch wouldn't be as receptive to, to the French, you know, particularly after the Lampiar of uh, <laughs> you know, the disaster year of 1672. So, yeah. uh, Mary Lennon had a question. Uh, in general, how many medals were part of an issue? So not necessarily the, the modern rarity, the present day rarity, but uh, how many were made at the time? That's a that's a great question and one I have no idea how to answer. Um, you know, I I would imagine that some of the medals uh, by Routier, for example, were done um, you know through well they were done through the Royal Mint, so this was uh, sort of an official issue of one sort. And if some of these issues were meant to be distributed to X number of officers and others, then you know they would have an idea of how many medals to produce, and they they might have then. And been able to limit them that way. Um, in terms of some of the other medals, the Dutch medals, I would imagine that these were just produced based on demand or perceived demand. So if they were meant for the popular market, you know, for example, to be sold at one of these, you know, uh, stalls at a fair that you know I showed a little bit earlier, where you have um, you know this fellow here selling prints. Um, you know, at a, at a market stall or a fair stall, 
But there very likely were sort of similar outlets uh, where some of these metals were offered as well. And, and in fact, in this other painting here, this uh, Kunstkammer by Franz Franken, you can see, you know, various metals and coins and everything else, you know, on the table there as well. So, um, <clears throat> you know, where where people were, you know, actually buying these, um, I'm not sure, but. Um, Artists like uh, Reiswick and um, and Müller were were probably just producing as many as they think they could sell and um, uh, and you know just combining things and ob obviously um, with Müller I mean he reused a lot of his reverses so he was you know, in a way trying to be as efficient as possible um, in producing some of these metals by you know just reusing designs that he had produced um, years or even decades earlier. You actually killed two birds with birds with one stone with that response because another question was how were the metals sold by subscription or in stores? So I don't know if you want to add anything more in particular, but I think you pretty pretty much. Yeah, uh, I, I mean we we don't really have, or at least I've not yet been able to find any accounts um, of where metals were sold there there's been a tremendous amount written on uh, the dutch art market you know at the time um, but i've in in all of that i've not been able to find anything yet on metals specifically and in fact one, one of the great things about doing research um, on this period and especially research you know in the netherlands is that um, the dutch have been exceptionally good at digitizing all sorts of archives and other um, uh, primary source material, uh, which is largely available online. And so, you know, through, um, and also their various museums, you know, they, there are a couple of uh, seafaring museums, the Schreepvaart Museum in Amsterdam, and as well as you know, the Rijksmuseum, the National Museum in Amsterdam as well. Um, they, they've done a superb job of just digitizing and putting things online. So um, there's a great deal that can be found um, you know, from the comfort of your, your own desk at home when doing uh, this sort of research. But again, despite the fact that this is a very well documented period and um, a lot of primary source material and a lot of now even secondary source material, obviously, they're just, I've just not been able to find um, as much as I would like on uh, the metals, uh, the medallic artists and um, question, you know, things like distribution. But I'm, I'm I'll keep trying. I'll keep reading as much of the stuff as I can. So, uh, we have from uh, Chester Sullivan. Can you say something about the portrait I see on the wall behind you? It's a little ah, off. yes. So this is a portrait um, that was done by um, Emily Waite. So I was forgetting the artist. Uh, Emily Waite of of um, Edward T. Newell, who was um, our uh, president and uh, curator of uh, Greek coins um, in the early 20th century from about 1916 to 1941. And a great deal of the Greek collection especially um, is based on his collection of roughly 90,000 coins that he donated or, or, be or actually was bequest um, uh, after his death in, in 1941. And in fact, if, if you do any research in the um, in the society's online catalog, you will, especially in the Greek side, you'll run across this accession 1944.100 uh, rather frequently, and those are all coins that Newell uh, donated. Um, unfortunately, we don't know a great deal about the history of this painting um, or even the artist Emily Waite. She's, she's not a particularly well-known artist and presume that she probably was a friend of uh, either Newell or Newell's wife, Audra, and that the painting was commissioned by them. Um, and the painting then, of course, ended up uh, in the basement of the society where it was for uh, a number of years um, before uh, we brought it with us um, over the two moves that we did in 2004 and again in 2008. So it, it is a favorite painting of ours. Um, when we are not hosting long tables uh, like we are today, we make sure to cover it up so it's protected from UV rays. So this is one of those rare moments when it's uncovered and we can all enjoy it. I know during his lifetime, he also uh, 
donated quite a bit of material, obviously not 90,000 objects like uh, were bequeathed to us, but uh, even in US medals and stuff like that along the way. Uh, so we definitely owe a lot to them for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, Chuck Oliver, thanks for a uh, such a well il illustrated and explained presentation, fantastically detailed and artistic prints and medals. Couldn't agree more. Um, Eric and Jennifer, uh, thank you for your presentation. All done. I'm not necessarily going to go through all the praises because uh, we can praise you all day again. Oh, thank um, you. If there aren't any other questions, I encourage anyone to unmute and please do ask them while we have a few more minutes. Yeah, in fact, one, one thing I also want to mention, um, the ANS does, in fact, have a fairly uh, significant collection of these 17th century Dutch medals, which unfortunately have not yet been registered to date. Um, this is a project that I've had on my to-do list for quite some time, and um, now that we are um, getting close to finishing this collective access transit, the back end essentially of our um, digital catalog, um, there is an opportunity finally opening up for me to uh, you know, really start working on this. And I've been talking to some colleagues in, in, the, in the Netherlands about uh, working together on uh, creating some sort of digital catalog of this material. Um, uh, since we have a fairly significant collection, and of course places like the Rijksmuseum does as well, and um, it would be a lot of fun, you know, for me particularly, to be able to uh, work with colleagues in in the Netherlands and um, be working on this type of material. So um, we'll see what we can do in the in the coming years with all that. But um, stay tuned. Indeed. Well, I, I think that about wraps it up. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, well done, as always. We all learned a lot. 